Goku is far more broken than you think he is. And there are times when I ask myself, did Toriyama, Toyotaro, and especially the anime writing team, did they even know how powerful they were writing Goku and his abilities when carrying out the story? There are certain moments where Goku demonstrates his power, which are narrated in accordance with the plot, but there are certain things he does out of the blue, and it doesn't even come across as a gag moment, it just simply happens, and can even make his power inconsistent to the story and to even his future power, ultimately making Goku stronger than the plot at times. And there are even moments where I ask, why didn't Goku do X, Y, or Z in the story? And it's because it would utterly bust his character beyond belief. There are no explanations in story other than the writers just shied away from giving Goku even more ridiculous power at certain times, just to go along with the plot, despite him being practically limitless anyway. But let's take a look at some of Goku's broken displays of power throughout Dragon Ball. Super Saiyan God is my favorite transformation in modern Dragon Ball. What is it about this transformation that is so damn likable? For me, it maintains the mystery of a great transformation. It's criminally underused, and I love how the form on its debut stemmed away from the traditional, let's add more to the form to show it stronger. How it took a more Bruce Lee approach, leaner and powerful instead of beefier and brutal. Why is Super Saiyan God stronger than most people realize? There have been so many explanation videos working out the power increase from base and from Super Saiyan 3. We've never had any official statement, everything has been incredibly vague when it comes to god power increases, to the point where it's so difficult to gauge, and you cannot fault us, we are trying to make sense of it, where the writers just haven't done that for us yet. Please give us a Dragon Ball Super Dizenshu when everything is finished. But what is actually right? Actually, let me rephrase that, because we don't know what exactly right is. The ultimate question is, what is the most reasonable? And what is the closest headcanon guess based on all of the material we have in Dragon Ball Super? For now, let's just stick with the anime of Dragon Ball Super. I feel like if we combine anime and manga, we will impact on the consistency of the power. Even more of an impact than in the anime already. Anime and manga are major different in power scaling. So let's run through the different methods of multipliers we already have for Super Saiyan God, and then at the end, I'll tell you which I use, which I feel is the best multiplier for Super Saiyan God. The nice and neat method. Now, I've heard some say Super Saiyan God is 10 times Super Saiyan 3. Is there evidence behind this, or is it simply because 10 is a nice number? How about 50 times Super Saiyan 3? 50 is also a nice number because it's a classic Super Saiyan 1 multiplier. There isn't much proof behind it, and a lot of people argue against it because it doesn't support the feat potential of Super Saiyan God in Battle of Gods. The Power Tiering Method You see, the punching power of Super Saiyan God clashing with Beerus, threatening the universe, it's incredibly powerful. This feat is something that a few undermine and downplay, but it truly is devastating. The feat in itself is low multiversal. Goku and Beerus were going to destroy the whole Universe 7 macrocosm in just a few punches. The macrocosm is endless and infinite according to scans in the Daisenshu. Toriyama created the ball-like world to help us get our heads around the infinitely sized universe. The Kaioshin realm is one-tenth the size of the macrocosm. How can it be one-tenth the size of infinity? Well, check out my boy Kazi. He recently power scaled Dragon Ball Super and gives a good understanding of what set theory means, where you can have a higher level of infinity, where the macrocosm is a higher level of infinity than the Kaioshin realm. Now, in simple terms, the macrocosm comprises of eight space times. Afterlife, Hell, Enma realm, Kaio realm, Living World, Outer Space, Demon realm, and the Kaioshin realm. So why is Super Saiyan God so powerful? Well, Goku is going to destroy all of that, every realm there, with just a few punches. It's low multiversal, and you need to be able to destroy two or more space-time continuums to be that. Now, if we consider Super Saiyan 3 and Dragon Ball Z Kai, where the Dragon Ball Super anime appears to continue from that in terms of linking continuities, Super Saiyan 3 doesn't even come close to the deadliness of Super Saiyan God. And this is only the early stages of Goku's new level of power in Super. In fact, many raise the case that Super Saiyan 3 Goku in Dragon Ball Z Kai and the manga is roughly galaxy level. And one multiplier I've seen associated to Super Saiyan God is by working out how much it would take the raw power of Super Saiyan 3 Goku that's galaxy level to get to low multiversal. And that's by using the theory of how many galaxies are in a universe, which could be 125 billion, and that's only in the observable universe. And that's applying that the Dragon Ball living world is like our own. This would not just mean Super Saiyan God is 125 
5 billion on top of Super Saiyan 3, because going with this method we have to count for there being 8 different space times in the Dragon Ball universe, not just the living world, so potentially 8 times this, and this may not even be all of the power. In order to get low multiversal by this method though, Super Saiyan God could be anyway up to 1 trillion on top of Super Saiyan 3, maybe more if just the punches with Beerus were enough to threaten the entire Universe 7. Now if that's 1 trillion on top of Super Saiyan 3, that would be 400 trillion on top of base form, and that's in terms of raw power going from galaxy level to low multiversal, but it could be way higher. And this is just Super Saiyan God after the ritual in the battle with Beerus before he even absorbed the power into his base form. The Super Saiyan God vs Kefla method. So let's move on to the tournament of power, where they battle because during this saga the Super Saiyan God multiplier is potentially retconned, or just inconsistent to the previous calculations using the power tiering system. Goku was having stamina issues after going Ultra Instinct Sign, but by the time he starts wielding Super Saiyan 2 again, his stamina is back on the rise, because soon after he goes Super Saiyan 3, then God, Blue, Kaioken, and then Sign once again within a matter of minutes. And the jump to God from Super Saiyan 2 would still be linear, due to their being the same base power, so we can eliminate the stamina argument in this comparison. The power of God leapfrogged Kaelin Cauliflower, then a fusion multiplier leapfrogged Super Saiyan God in a similar show of dominance. And a state by Vados, and in the right in itself, fusion is pretty much the sum of the parts, then multiply tens of times. So is fusion roughly the same jump in power as Super Saiyan God? Apparently not with the statement in the Battle of Gods, where Goku believed fusion wouldn't be enough against Beerus, and the narration made it clear that Super Saiyan God was the only level of power to deal with a plot threat. So how can a tens of times multiplier from fusion even come close to the trillions we just calculated through the tiering system? This is where we come to some fusion headcanon because I believe there is some form of truth to how fusion's power was implied during the tournament of power. So as we know there are multiple sources of fusion power boosts. We get A times B in the Daisenshu, we get 10 stronger, dozen stronger in various material such as the Densetsu and GT Perfect Files. We also get tens of times after the sum of the parts in the super anime. And in the Broly movie we also get by Gogeta saying the powers aren't just added together but significantly magnified. So when you combine all of the material and what we have, pretty much all of them support each other in some way except A times B. A times B is extremely broken and doesn't give a stable or set multiplier for fusion. When using this, the power gaps can become very messy and out of control. And not only that, the equation doesn't even work if both powers are 1. 1 times 1 equals 1. The fusion wouldn't even be stronger. And that goes against what fusion is. However, using collective points, the sum of the parts followed by a power magnification works best, and that kind of makes sense in our heads for what fusion is. Their powers join together, and then they skyrocket even more after combining. And I feel that's reasonable. And this brings us to tens of times. What do we class as tens of times? 40, 50, 60, 190, surely tens end at 190 because 200 would be classed as hundreds, right? 190 could be considered the high ball and 30 could be considered a low ball. So when we work out the mean here, we get about 110, but because we love nice neat numbers, I tend to go with the fusion multiplier being A plus B then times 100, and I feel that's reasonable. But what do I mean by A plus B? Well, A plus B base forms then times 100, in Vegito's case, would never match Buhan back in Z. It would result in a power closer to Super Saiyan 2 Goku back then. And we both know base Vegeta was far greater than that level. So A plus B I refer to as the strongest of both warriors. Add their best then times 100. So Vegito in Z, Super Saiyan 3 Goku plus Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta then times 100. That's base Vegito's power. So essentially, base Vegito is over 100 times Super Saiyan 3 Goku. And you can't really knock that. I mean, Boo Tanks would waste Super Saiyan 3 Goku. And then he went a tier stronger after absorbing Gohan. Base Vegito is far above Super Saiyan 3 Goku. But this also works for a theoretical Vegito pre-Super Saiyan God in Battle of Gods. At that time, Goku and Vegeta did not have God powers, so the God powers would not be accounted for in the best of both parts in the fusion. Whereas later on in other sagas and movies, God powers are accounted for. And this in turn makes base Gogeta stronger than Super Saiyan God Goku against Broly, because base Gogeta's power is made up of Goku's solo Super Saiyan God power and so much more. But back to Kefla versus Super Saiyan God, incredibly powerful, so how much of a jump is Super Saiyan God here? Well, Super 
Super Saiyan 2 Goku versus the two of them, he managed to hold his own despite being overwhelmed at times. But right before he went God, he was able to block their attacks and show confidence that that won't work again. So Goku, I don't feel was equal to Kale and Cauliflower together, but he wasn't getting completely dominated towards the end. Therefore, I'd give them a 1.25 times domination multiplier over Super Saiyan 2 Goku. If you guys know anything about domination multipliers in Dragon Ball, it's usually a power that's roughly 1.25 times stronger is enough to start overwhelming someone. But two times stronger is usually when you can tank the opponent and literally destroy them. Super Saiyan God Goku is able to completely dominate both Kale and Cauliflower. But when Kefla forms, she appears slightly more dominant. However, it's worth noting Goku could dodge and block Kefla's attacks although it appeared difficult for him to do so. So it would be reasonable to put base Kefla at 1.25 times stronger than Super Saiyan God here. And this supports the basis that Super Saiyan God could be a fusion boost in power with this method. Super Saiyan God is 10,000 times base form going with the Vados statement combined with how it performed against Kefla. I like this multiplier, but it definitely doesn't sit well with some to think that Super Saiyan God is 25 times Super Saiyan 3. It definitely doesn't sit well with the bad Battle of Gods portrayal of Super Saiyan God, but it could work with everything post Battle of Gods, as this portrayal of power is possibly a retcon. Or there's this deep theory that the Super Saiyan God ritual was different to just transforming into Super Saiyan God later down the line, and we get a headache thinking about how Vegeta caught back up if he didn't get the ritual multiplier. So I don't go with that for obvious reasons, but at the end of the day, it's just another headcanon multiplier using all of the vague info we have. It's very difficult to apply the tournament of power Super Saiyan God multiplied to Battle of Gods, but it doesn't undermine just how powerful Super Saiyan God is. Even if it is 25 times Super Saiyan 3, that is incredibly powerful if you only need to be two times stronger than someone to completely dominate them. Just think about it that way. Which brings us to this final method, the Super Saiyan God vs Vegito method. It's my personal favorite, and I'm using the Vegito was not enough to beat Beerus statement, so Super Saiyan God would be above that by a reasonable and justifiable amount. Let's begin with Vegito's power pre-Super Saiyan God. So the strongest levels of power to make a fusion before God would have been Super Saiyan 3 plus Super Saiyan 2. And this is with the understanding of Goku that he thinks that he and Vegeta are level in base form and not knowing about that's my Bulma moment because he didn't know he was on King Kai's planet. So Super Saiyan 3 plus Super Saiyan 2 equals a 500 times one base form part. Multiply that for fusion, 50,000 times one base form part or 50,000 times base Goku. That is base Vegito. Now some use the theoretical or Super Saiyan 3 Vegito for Goku's gauge of Beerus versus Fusion, and that's okay. Super Vegito would be the most logical power because that's who the audience resonates with, but Goku would know what he could do when he was Vegito, but I'm gonna go with Super Vegito because it works in respect with the failed God ritual. Now, Super Saiyan Vegito is 2.5 million times base Goku. A multiplier of 2.5 million wouldn't be enough to deal with suppressed Beerus. So Super Saiyan God through the plot and through basic knowledge of Fusion power would be way beyond a 2.5 million multiplier. But the question is, how much more? While it's stated that you have to emit twice the key than your opponent to absolutely dominate them in a fight, the failed Super Saiyan God ritual elevated Goku's power to the highest in history, which would include Super Vegito, as Super Saiyan 3 Vegito never surfaced. So by using that understanding, failed Super Saiyan God ritual Goku's power is at least two times Super Vegito if this new power was to dominate Super Vegito, making this turbocharged Super Saiyan five million times his initial base form. And from there, if we use the same basis that Super Saiyan God can dominate the failed Ritual Goku's power, that would be at least two times that, meaning Super Saiyan God is 10 million times base form. But again, it could be as high as 40 million if we were to use two times Super Saiyan 3 Vegito. So you can see why many fans put the Super Saiyan God multiplier in the millions range. So in conclusion, Super Saiyan God is a messy form with a messy multiplier that requires messy head cannon in places. I don't see anyone's version of the multiplier wrong. I just see well explained methods and poorly explained methods. And I hope my method today is one that you enjoyed and helped you learn just how powerful Super Saiyan God is depending on which angle you calculate from. Super Saiyan Blue is actually the greatest natural Saiyan transformation in the Dragon Ball Super continuity, both anime and manga. 
There is no other transformation above it in terms of say and only parameters. You could argue God is the best natural state if you wanted to in terms of balance, but let's be honest, Dragon Ball is about power now more than ever. Blue's increasing power and speed from God totally overshadows the lack of stamina problems now. Originally known as Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan, it's a heightened transformation unique to the members of the Saiyan race. A hybrid version of God and the original Super Saiyan form, Goku actually describes it literally as that. The Super Saiyan form of Super Saiyan God. Goku and Vegeta mastered God Key to become a Super Saiyan God. Goku with the ritual first, but later on no longer requiring the ritual of five other Saiyans to elevate into the Super Saiyan God realms. At that time, Goku was mortal. The other five with Saiyan blood were also mortal. They performed the Saiyan ritual, and that was all that was required. Six mortal Saiyans. The power came from all of them. No magical god appeared above them in the heavens and pointed the finger to Goku and said, I grant you the power. No, the power came from the mortal Saiyans, thus making the ritual a natural mortal situation for the Saiyans. Does it feel magical? Of course it does. But you cannot deny six mortal Saiyans did this alone. Despite being very rare, it is genetically natural. Anyone could have been the Super Saiyan God as long as the conditions were set with five other Saiyans. Further down the line, Goku and Vegeta would be able to use Super Saiyan God in the anime and manga where it was stated Vegeta obtained the transformation on his own, thus further strengthening the case that Super Saiyan God is completely natural to Saiyan blood. It just required the right type of training and potential unlocking, that being Goku and Vegeta's mastery of their own key to a divine level. We have to remember this, the potential of Goku and Vegeta was already there. Whis only trained and guided them to explore their potential even further, the power they already had. Whis didn't give them any power. That was all Goku and Vegeta's power and plot armor. So Saiyan God is indeed natural and can be obtained later on just by key control. It made much more sense to be called Saiyan God. The Super Saiyan part now brings us to the next point though, and that relating to the original Super Saiyan transformation. Now like I said, Blue combines the two huge legends, where the original Super Saiyan form was centered around being an emotionally driven transformation, obviously tingly concepts and bargain sales ruin that down the line, but Super Saiyan God was a form centered on the user's key being wielded at the divine level, undetected by regular key users, thus pushing their strength to the next level. Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan God were almost completely different in the way they used their key. I always saw Super Saiyan as external key usage and God as internal key usage, focused and controlled for stronger hits. But in terms of looks, does the palette swap blue stand up to the original golden look and the newer leaner godly red? Well, you could say it's the third piece to the puzzle. Red, yellow, and blue, primary colors. It's simple, lazy, but simple. But for some reason, when I first saw Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan, I thought it was a nice balance of Goku maintaining some of his muscle whilst appearing to have a different kind of internally flowing aura, but still having the iconic Super Saiyan 1 hairstyle, but with a tranquil blue look. The simplicity was nice, and I do respect that part of blue. Does this type of transformation suit a Saiyan by nature? Suit is up for debate. It's whatever you believe Saiyans are to be by nature. All we know is that Saiyans were brutes, hungry conquering pirates who had a lust for war. Calm tranquil forms definitely doesn't suit that. But what about Saiyans hundreds and thousands of years ago? Okay, let's go back even further than Yamoshi for this. Maybe a type of Saiyan way before these ones had a similar genetic code, but perhaps they were far more peaceful. I mean, just imagine Universe 6 Saiyans, that sort of temperament. I mean, look at humans these days on Earth. More humans than ever before sit on one computer and have almost non-active lifestyles. That was never built into our DNA. We were fighters and survivors hundreds and thousands of years ago. So maybe the Super Saiyan Blue form, the combination of the two legendary forms in the Saiyan genetic code, maybe it suits what Saiyans truly were back then. Unless of course Blue is something never seen before in the Saiyan genetic code and it's purely an evolution thanks to Goku and Vegeta. Which brings me to the variations of Super Saiyan Blue, the perfected Blue and the evolution. Now you could actually say both of these are still natural to Saiyans, they are just enhanced versions of the blue already there. And that truly means Vegeta has the best natural Saiyan form to date. So there's a Vegeta win there for you guys. Goku has Ultra Instinct, but it ain't no Saiyan form. Vegeta got the top state of the Saiyan so far in the super continuity, but what about the blue Kaioken? Well, again, it's still the regular blue. The Kaioken is not really a natural ability for Saiyan. It's not natural for anybody to double, triple, 20 times the power outside of its regular limits. So Vegeta still owns the top spot for having the best natural Saiyan transformation. But what about Super Saiyan Rose? Well, despite being the equal to Super Saiyan Blue, it's actually different because instead of a mortal Saiyan who obtains God Key, Rose is the form taken by a Saiyan who is purely divine. Being purely divine is unnatural. It's a divine being as a whole, not someone mortal who trained to obtain God Key like Goku and Vegeta. So Rose is not actually a natural Saiyan state, despite being the equivalent to Blue. You could consider it to be the best, 
but it definitely has certain parameters that doesn't class it as natural. Overall, Super Saiyan Blue is the best natural form of the Saiyans to date in terms of Dragon Ball Super continuity. It has surpassed all of the other forms before it by a large margin. But unfortunately, the power of the gods and angels with Ultra Instinct is now overshadowing Super Saiyan Blue, making it more irrelevant with each passing chapter. Super Saiyan Blue is far stronger than you think, and far stronger than the Super Saiyan Blue you think you know. The multiplier of power behind Blue is relentless. So scary from a statistical standpoint, and I think it's one of the most broken forms in Dragon Ball history, especially with all the enhancements the form is fed throughout the anime and manga. But today, I want to mainly focus on the anime. Now, the power of Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan. Some think it's only the power of Super Saiyan 1 added to Super Saiyan God, and let me tell you why that isn't true and it's not possible. Let's use a theoretical number for Goku's base form. 10. The Super Saiyan multiplier would make that power 500. Now, even if we use the lowest Super Saiyan God multiplier I calculated, that being 10,000, that would give 100,000 for Super Saiyan God. Now, the reason why Blue isn't just Super Saiyan God plus Super Saiyan is because that would be 100,500, and that makes absolutely no difference to Super Saiyan God alone, which is 100,000. To be considered the next level from Super Saiyan God, Goku may as well use Super Saiyan God Kaioken times 2 to exceed a theoretical Blue this way. That's why it's not just an addition, but rather a Super Saiyan multiplier of the Super Saiyan God power. And by using the three potential multipliers of Super Saiyan God, they become the following amps from base form for Super Saiyan Blue. Now, I just want you to think about this for a second. How ridiculous this actually is. To be able to fully tank opponents unharmed, you need to disperse key or a level of power two times the opponent's attack. Just two times, where if you're 1.25 times stronger, there's a good chance you're going to win unless you get outsmarted. Imagine for one moment, you're having an equal battle with someone, and then out of nowhere, they get 20 quadrillion times stronger. Not two times, so your punches don't phase them anymore. 20 quadrillion times stronger. Is this the problem with multipliers and scaling? It seems broken enough to me. Either way, if you love power scaling and Dragon Ball that way, that's how much of a difference Super Saiyan Blue is from a statistical point of view. And even if you go with the 500,000 times jump from base form, Super Saiyan 3 is 400 times. But half a million? That's insane, my friends. And it doesn't stop there. Let's add the Kaioken Cherry on top. 20 times, good heavens above. 400 quadrillion times multiplier from base form, or 400 billion or 10 million, using the other methods. From base form, and this is a base form that already absorbed the power of Super Saiyan God. So the difference in power compared to the beginning of Dragon Ball Super Goku is unbelievable. You can also apply these multipliers to Super Saiyan Blue Evolution, as that's seen as a counterpart to Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20. All right, so we can feel that power bubbling. Now I want to give an honorable mention to the power of Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta versus Broly during the movie, because that was how Super Saiyan Blue should be portrayed. A mountain of hell. And holy hell is Broly strong for being able to adapt to a number of forms of Goku and Vegeta. But the fusion amp combined with Super Saiyan Blue made Gogeta look like a lion hunting its prey. I've talked about the fusion amp being A plus B then times 100 in the past. Check out my fusion video for the details why, but A plus B is the strongest of both parts, then times 100 because tens of times. It makes sense due to a number of sources, and fusion amps vary depending on the potential of each individual part. Now let's just cap Goku and Vegeta's power to Super Saiyan Blue for a low ball of Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta's power, because it gets complicated when you start talking about Mastered Blue evolutions or Ultra Instincts or Kaiokens. Let's use the multiplication of power of Super Saiyan Blue being 20 quadrillion for Goku, 20 quadrillion for Vegeta. Stack together, that's 40 quadrillion of an increase from one base form. Then multiply by 100, you get 4 quintillion of an increase from one base form part. And this is only base form Gogeta. Respectively, using my other Super Saiyan Blue multipliers, base Gogeta could also be 400 billion or 100 million. And then you get 80 decillion times of an increase for Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta from base form Goku or Vegeta, or 800 quintillion or 50 trillion for my other methods. That is magnificent. Even though Broly was adapting to each new level of power, the jump from base Gogeta to Super Saiyan Blue was far too much of a climb, and Gogeta eventually broke Broly's ribcage. 
And nowadays, Goku is combining Super Saiyan Blue with Ultra Instinct. Like, what the hell? I don't even want to calculate what that generates in terms of power. It's getting ridiculous. I know there are inconsistencies in Dragon Ball, especially when it comes to firing lasers through God Powers or other fighters without God Power matching God Powers. It's all for cinematics and drama. Dragon Ball makes no sense, but on paper, Super Saiyan Blue is a powerhouse. And if you want to get serious in your versus battles, you could blitz a lot of the competition out of the water in Dragon Ball using Super Saiyan Blue especially when you go by the good old domination multipliers Blue is absolutely broken and can never be repaired Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods and Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F. We're going to look at that continuity of Dragon Ball. We're going to look at how strong the characters are going from one movie to the other since the Buu Saga. This one will surprise you guys. The movie characters here are no joke. So let's start this off with the movie that started the resurgence of Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods. At the end of the movie, we get confirmation Beerus used around 70% of his maximum power from Whis. This is stated when they are alone, so there's no doubt this is a truthful conversation between them, as it was essentially Whis clarifying this after reviewing the fight. Whis would know Beerus' full capabilities. Beerus also calls Goku's latent ability unfathomable, but wouldn't call him an arch-rival yet. This just means Goku has the potential to eventually surpass Beerus. It's reasonable to say the 70% power was the level of power felt right at the end of the fight. But in order to calculate that as best we can, let's go back to the beginning of Goku vs Beerus on King Kai's planet because Beerus' power gradually increases throughout the movie. We don't know how much stronger Goku's base form had got since the fight with Kid Buu, but depending on how much time has passed by, you would assume some strength has been gained. I tend to give Goku a 1.25 times increase since the Buu saga which means his power has increased a tier, but nothing too insane. Beerus rocks up and the suppressed power he uses pretty much is able to outclass Super Saiyan 3 Goku in every possible way. The insanely suppressed power is at least two times Super Super Saiyan 3 Goku to completely dominate him. But due to this being the God of Destruction, and how one effortless chop ended Super Saiyan 3 Goku, we can go with Beerus' insanely suppressed power being 2.5 times Super Saiyan 3 Goku. But like I said, we should just go with what we see as we go along, even though we know it's more from gut feeling alone. As a basic example here, let's use Buu Saga base Goku as a 10. FYI, the following will not be actual power levels, but rather an example amount where at the end of the video, I'll reveal the multipliers for movie Super Saiyan God, Beerus, and the new base Goku or from the power of base Goku in the Buu Saga. Okay, so Super Saiyan 3 Buu Saga Goku is 4,000. Slap the 1.25 times boost on Goku for a training growth since the Buu Saga and we get 5,000, where his base form is 12.5. Insanely suppressed Beerus is at least 12,500 at this moment in time. Now, despite what we think we know, inverse Goku's dialogue would be more reliable in understanding Beerus's power or at least gauge in it, as well as his own capabilities as Vegito. He believed fusion wouldn't be enough, and this implies Goku has estimated what he thinks would be Beerus' full power, which would cause problems for a theoretical Vegito fusion. Little does Goku realize his gauging is nowhere near Beerus' full power. So let's quickly work out fusion. In previous videos, I've used A plus B, then times 100, where A and B are the strongest versions of each part. This has worked well for a number of videos and has been the most reliable in terms of compiling multiple sources. And it also makes sense for stronger fusion amps after god powers are obtained. So using Super Saiyan 3 Goku as 5000, we can then calculate calculate Vegeta. The My Bulma moment hasn't happened yet, so I think the most reliable Vegeta base we should use is 12.5, the same as Goku's, as it's unclear at this point if Vegeta surpassed Goku or not. So Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta is 1,250. Their power together is 6,250, multiply by 100, 625,000 for base Vegito, Super Saiyan Vegito is 31 million. Now it's always debated which Vegito form Goku is gauging Beerus 2. Super Saiyan or a theoretical Super Saiyan 3. You can go either way, but I now like to use a theoretical Super Saiyan 2 Vegito because we and the characters both know each part can go at least Super Saiyan 2. So that would be a reliable level for a serious Vegito. That gives 62,500,000 and then I also apply a multiplier of 2.2 for a theoretical Kamehameha magnification, as normally if Goku's punches and kicks don't work, he goes for the Kamehameha to see if that makes the difference. So it makes sense that Goku thinks Super Saiyan 2 Vegito's Kamehameha wouldn't be enough against Beerus. The level of power of Super Saiyan 2 Vegito's Kamehameha is 137 million, and if Goku's expectations of Beerus were to be a tier above that, let's add a domination multiplier of 1.25 times to get 171 million for the level of power Goku believes Beerus is at. Now just because that's the level of power Goku 
Goku believes Beerus is Max is, doesn't mean Beerus is using that level of power against Goku or the others. As when we get to Earth, Beerus ignites a purple aura and makes short work of everyone, including Majin Buu, Gotenks, Gohan, and we all know Super Saiyan 3 is above Majin Buu. Gohan didn't do any better than Buu. We don't know if Gohan is the same as the Buu Saga or weaker. It can get very messy working out Beerus' power here against each fighter, but the most useful one we should use to gauge Beerus is Vegeta. Before Vegeta gets mad, Beerus actually takes on Super Saiyan Vegeta and pounds him a few times, and even praised Vegeta's battle skill. It's hard to gauge Vegeta against Goku at this point, as that was not a power comparison. It's not until Vegeta rages out that the narrative finally informs us that Vegeta surpassed Goku. Straight away, that puts Vegeta's enraged Super Saiyan 2 power a tier above Super Saiyan 3 Goku, so 6,250, to the point he takes a punch to the face and hits Beerus, who is surprised. It's hard to know what level Beerus is during the combo attack but it's clear after tanking the Gallic Gun, he gradually raised his power to negate it. That's certain. The Gallic Gun multiplier is approximately three times of a boost, so 18,750. In order to tank it unharmed, the opponent needs to be two times that, so 37,500. This goes hand in hand in seeing Beerus power up slightly after the put-in, and being able to handle everyone with chopsticks, but still not near the power that Goku believes Beerus to be at for max. Now let's talk about the ritual. First, the failed ritual. Goku receives everything everyone's power. Gohan, Krillin, and everyone except Piccolo are amazed by the power. Nothing in the movie is stated about it being the best power of all time, so it's difficult in this movie to gauge it to Vegito's max power in any way. The best we can do, and most reliable, is to add up the power of each fighter because that's all that happened. They gave their power. Goku's power as Super Saiyan 1 is 625. Vegeta's theoretical new Super Saiyan 1 form would be 3,125 due to the rage boost earlier. Temporary or permanent, I'm counting it. Either way, whichever way they transfer power, the receiver becomes the same level of power in the end anyway. It just happens to be Goku because Goku. Gohan, Trunks, and Gotens combine Super Saiyan power. I'm not really sure, but I think it's reasonable to say Super Saiyan 1 Gohan is a tier below Goku since the Buu Saga, and then Goten and Trunks being half of that. Just for ease here, Super Saiyan Gohan is 500, Super Saiyan Goten and Trunks are 250 each. Altogether, makes Goku's new Super Saiyan 1 4,750 his new base form 95, making Goku's base 7.6 times stronger than it was on King Kai's planet. And then that could be gauged to be 38,000 for his new Super Saiyan 3 power. This can be considered borrowed power, not a permanent increase, but you could also make the argument that Goku can make new levels of power his own, as demonstrated later with Super Saiyan God. So there's no issue with this being his new level of power. Maybe they should just keep holding each other's hands and absorbing each other's power for month after month. Go ask Toriyama to put that in his next script and see how he feels about such a hack. Anyway, currently Beerus suppressed has shown 37,500, so it's clear this wouldn't be enough to take on Beerus, and Goku realizes this here. You can see it in his eyes, this is nowhere near enough. Then we get the actual Super Saiyan God, and this is where we have to take a leap of faith to gauge it. Goku is impressed with the power. He takes on Beerus with a bit more spark, and there seems to be no doubt in his attitude initially. This would insinuate the new power Goku has, has surpassed the fusion amp he had doubts about. Throughout this fight, Beerus heightens his intensity. We previously gauged Beerus at 171 million, due to Fusion not being enough, so Super Saiyan God would naturally be the next level up from Fusion. As I said, Fusions past this point would be stronger because one of the Fusion parts has a higher level of power with God. Anyway, if we gauged Beerus at 171 million, and that being a tier above Super Saiyan 2 Vegito's Kamehameha, then it's only sensible to put Super Saiyan God Goku a tier above that power as well, ultimately matching Goku's anticipated power for Beerus, which is apparent at the beginning of the fight, they are essentially hitting each other back and forth, and even before the fight started, Beerus said this was worth the wait. Next, Goku and Beerus chatter about Goku obtaining the power. Goku isn't happy. Beerus steps up his game here, punching Goku in the gut and hitting him around smashing him through mountains. This is where I believe Beerus increased his power to be 1.25 times Super Saiyan God Goku, allowing him to outclass him ever so. I now put Beerus at 214 million. He literally whips Goku for a while. Now it gets interesting. They end up in a cave and Goku says he's been fighting at 80%. Simply put, 100% Super Saiyan God would be 206 million, which would be roughly what Beerus is fighting at now. Goku then strikes at Beerus, only this time Super Saiyan God disappears visually. 
but he continues fighting with roughly the same intensity of power and speed against the same level of Beerus, and he's still in base form. So base Goku is fighting with roughly 171 million. Goku transforms into a Super Saiyan, instantly amping that power by 50 times. Beerus then ignites his aura, and we now see the two finally go in balls deep with each other. Piccolo refers to Goku as a mere Super Saiyan, meaning Goku has absorbed the raw power of Super Saiyan God to continue fighting, not necessarily the type of ki that can't be sensed, just the raw power, and they fight equally for a while. Goku powers up a Kamehameha, and this shocks Beerus. Beerus successfully blocks it and smiles, but he had to block it. So this part is important to work out where Beerus is in this moment. Beerus launches his Sphere of Destruction, and because we don't know the power multiplier of that attack, we can go with 2.2 like the Kamehameha for now. This one clearly starts to overwhelm Goku, and it's at this time Beerus says Super Saiyan God ran out a while ago, but said that Goku absorbed the God power into his body and didn't realize it during the fight, but also says when he returned to normal, he hadn't powered down that much at all. And that would make sense being Goku's base form earlier. Beerus saying all that much implies there was some decrease in power, but not a massive amount. Therefore, we can reduce Goku's God power by 1.25 times. Goku's new base form would be 137 million. His Super Saiyan form would be 6 billion, and his Super Saiyan Kamehameha would be 15 billion. Now the way I gauge Beerus here is how he had to up his game and put up a decent blocking position to stop Goku's Kamehameha and damaged. If he could tank it without lifting a finger, I would have easily put him two times Goku's Super Saiyan Kamehameha. I put Beerus here at 1.75 times Goku's Kamehameha. Beerus right now, 26 billion. The Sphere of Destruction would be 58 billion, and is 8.4 times stronger than Super Saiyan Goku, where it easily overwhelms him, and then his base form crumbles. However, we see Super Saiyan God surface once again. Super Saiyan God Goku nullifies the energy ball in one burst, causing it to fade away entirely and Goku is left drained. But when Goku turns Super Saiyan God again, Goku had to unleash power at least 2.5 times the Sphere of Destruction to do that, making Goku's final level of power in Super Saiyan God at 145 billion. We have to remember, it was stated Beerus used 70% of his power by Whis, but it was also stated Goku wasn't at Beerus's level. This would mean a theoretical 100% Beerus has to be higher than what Super Saiyan God Goku displayed there. Plus also keep in mind, Toriyama's original ranking of Goku as a 6, Beerus a 10, Whis is a 15, especially when this was said during the Battle of Gods movie. So from a narrative perspective and considering Toriyama's ranking system, which isn't a power scale in itself, it's just a rough idea of power gaps, it would be reasonable to suggest 100% Super Saiyan God Goku is around 60% Beerus, making 100% Beerus 242 billion. It's stated Beerus went 70% at some point, but it's never stated when he used 70% or which skirmish. But I have an idea when Beerus finally unlocks 70% that makes sense with this scale. When Goku nullified Beerus' final attack, there's a moment Beerus asks Goku what he just did and proceeds to ignite his aura and poses as if he's about to unleash destruction on Goku. It's at this small moment I believe Beerus started revealing 70% of his power. I don't believe his previous skirmishes were at 70%, more like 10-30%, to 30%, but I do feel it makes the most sense that Beerus eventually felt the necessity for 70% after Goku negated his Sphere of Destruction. But sadly, Goku's all tuckered out and Beerus had a soft spot, so the fight gets postponed. Forever. What does this mean in terms of multipliers of God? Well, I don't think going Super Saiyan God on top of an already God-absorbed base form gives the same multiplier as the initial ritual. Based on what we see, it seems more appropriate for future manual Super Saiyan God transformations to be a different multiplier, where Goku or Vegeta keep the ritual God power multiplier in base to put them at a new base level, because if it was another 2 million multiplier on top of the new God-absorbed base form, then 70% of Beerus, even 100 100% would be blown right out of the water by thousands of times, and he and Whis actually had a conversation that Goku hasn't surpassed him. There's definitely an increase though, but not another 2 million. If we did the initial Super Saiyan God multiplier of 2 million on top of a God-absorbed base, it makes the return in Super Saiyan God 373 trillion, which is over 9,000 times, no pun intended, stronger than 100% Beerus, 
and that doesn't fit, which is why I believe the manual activation of Super Saiyan God is much less of an amp than the initial Ritual God base absorbed buff. Think of it like Goku has accessed the world of the gods. They are just at a new bar of base power, but can still benefit from a new Super Saiyan God form in itself, which is the next one after Super Saiyan 3, from a 400 times multiplier to a 1000 times multiplier. But it's the new base form that's the real big factor here to his power. So how much stronger is Goku and Beerus at the end of the movie to the start of the movie? Well, we use 10 for Buu Saga base Goku and 12.5 for start of Battle of Gods Goku. So you can divide everything by 10 or 12.5 depending on your landmark. Ultimately, throughout the movie, Goku's base form gets 11 million times stronger. The ritual Super Saiyan God amp is 2 million and the manual Super Saiyan God activation later on would be a thousand times base form. 100% Beerus is 1.6 times stronger than End of Battle of Gods 100% Super Saiyan God Goku. 100% Beerus was 48 million times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku on King Kai's planet, and 60 million times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu. Thank you all for watching all of the way through. Even the Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods movie is ridiculous in terms of power-ups from the Buu saga. Always remember that this is not official information it's just my take on it, as I'm sure you've all got your own takes too. Help me up by hitting the like button and stick around because I want to cover the Resurrection F movie and what that movie means in terms of Beerus and Goku's power. The Resurrection F movie is the continuation of the Battle of Gods movie, before Dragon Ball Super even came out. Both these movies are Toriyama's original vision. Toei adapted these movies to the anime series, so this movie continuity is going to remain consistent with the movie beforehand. And with that being said, it was officially confirmed in the Battle of Gods movie. At the end, we stated Beerus reached and tapped into 70% of his power, which was displayed right at the end before Beerus powered down. But now we are in Resurrection F, we will uncover the power of Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan and Beerus to see what changes there are. For anyone that thinks Beerus' power is static and doesn't change, you are mistaken. It's not easy to explain because we know there are many continuities that Beerus is in. So let's keep this focused on just the movie continuity and don't you dare bring in the manga or the anime series to discuss. First, a quick note about Vegeta's power catch-up. We know Goku and Vegeta both train with Whis in secret away from Beerus. They have done so for months. We don't know what methods we used to get Vegeta's base to somewhat near Goku's. We don't know how he got Super Saiyan God, whether he got a ritual, or whether his power caught up to Goku just through training with Whis. It actually doesn't matter how, all that matters is that it is. And that Goku and Vegeta's base appear around equal in this movie. Beerus is always implied to be above Goku and Vegeta in this movie, as well as later on when Golden Frieza soils himself because of Beerus' presence. Frieza cannot sense power, but Beerus certainly can. He can sense Frieza's power, and he acts very confident in front of Golden Frieza. So it's a no-brainer Beerus has gotten stronger since the Battle of Gods movie, just by sleeping apparently. In Resurrection F, you will learn that Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan and Golden Freezer Eclipse. Battle of Gods Beerus' 100% power by a long shot. Gotta love plot power-ups. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is that we says if Goku and Vegeta work together in the Resurrection F movie, they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Beerus. That would imply around equal footing. And this tells me that Beerus is around two times Super Saiyan Blue in the Resurrection F movie. I'm sorry. Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan. So how strong is first form Frieza? All we need to know is that Gohan, Piccolo, and everyone else are fodder in this movie. There's nothing to suggest any of them achieved a smidge of the power that Goku and Vegeta has in these movies. They are all, at most, high Cell Saga level. Even Gohan has fallen a lot due to specific dialogue in the movie about him not being able to manage Super Saiyan 1. And it's stated First Form Frieza is on an entirely different level. None of them, even together, stand a chance. We will soon calculate all Frieza forms, so stay tuned. So how strong is Goku and Vegeta after the Whis training? Goku shows up and powers up to the level known as Saiyan Beyond God. Now you should know that there is official source material by Toriyama specifying what this level is. And it was specifically for the Resurrection F movie. And during this movie, there was no Super Saiyan God anymore. The intention was that the Super Saiyan God power was fully absorbed by Goku to hit the next realm of power. The Dragon Ball Super series by Toei added a bunch of other stuff, including the Super Saiyan God transformation later down the line once again. But during the Resurrection F movie, at that time, 
Toriyama intended for there to be no more Super Saiyan God. The purpose was done, the power was absorbed. So in the Battle of Gods movie, when Goku absorbed the God Key, then turned Super Saiyan with golden hair, you may question why he didn't turn blue then, if it was Super Saiyan with the power of God. Well, it's because Battle of Gods Goku didn't fully absorb the Super Saiyan God power. He absorbed some of it, but not all of it. Hence why he didn't turn blue in Battle of Gods during the final fight. Goku turns blue only if he's wielding 100% of the God power, then stack Super Saiyan on top. Anything less, stacking Super Saiyan on top will result in the golden hair. Which is why it makes sense that the training with Whis allowed Goku and Vegeta to train and fully absorb and master the God Key into base form, which is what Saiyan Beyond God is, thus later granting them access to Super Saiyan Blue. They can't go to that level until the previous is mastered. And this goes in line with Toriyama's statement about Goku no longer needing to transform into Super Saiyan God because he's finally absorbed all of the God power into base form. The full Super Saiyan God power in Battle of Gods was 145 billion, so Goku's base has got from 137 million, so at least a thousand times stronger. And for the purposes of this, I'm placing Vegeta at the same now. Saiyan Beyond God in Resurrection F, 145 billion. Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan is literally stated to be the next level of Super Saiyan God. God power with the power of a Super Saiyan. So to think it's anything else other than Saiyan Beyond God times 50 is ridiculous. So Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan is 7 trillion. Frieza was 1.5 times weaker than Saiyan Beyond God, as he was overwhelming Frieza with ease and couldn't even get hit. So 100% Frieza is 95 billion. Now the question is raised, was Frieza using 100% of his power in his final form or 50% because he wasn't bulky? You can choose whatever you like, but for ease, I'm going with Frieza at 100% final form because he learned to control the power through training and removed the strain. But again, you can choose what you like. Frieza's first form power Power is his 100% form divided by 226, giving 420 million, which is 42 million times stronger than Buu Saga base Goku, who has a 10. That's insane for first form Frieza. He's literally one shot in the Buu Saga. Golden Frieza is 1.25 times Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan Goku in raw power at the beginning of the fight, so 9 trillion. This means the golden form multiplier is 95 to 100 times his final form in order to close the gap on Super Saiyan God and then surpass Super Saiyan Blue initially. However, when Frieza loses power due to fatigue, he's around 3.5 trillion due to Goku tanking his hits. Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Goku and Vegeta in Resurrection F are 725 billion times stronger than Buu Saga base Goku and Vegeta. Finally, I just want to refer to the power of Beerus to finish off this video. I'm inclined to believe for this movie, Beerus is around 15 trillion. Due to the fact we stated if Goku and Vegeta work together, presumably as Super Saiyan Blue, they could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Beerus. Not necessarily defeat him, but at least give him a decent fight. So Beerus could be a little bit higher, perhaps even 20 trillion. Furthermore, Frieza was still terrified of Beerus. Whether that was just a reputation thing, it's possible. Frieza doesn't know how strong Beerus really is, but why would he take the risk, right? This is Beerus. Yet it would be stupid if they wrote Golden Frieza with a power massively exceeding all Battle of God's powers to be in fear of someone who used 70% against Super Saiyan God Goku. Makes no sense. Therefore, it's reasonable to suggest Beerus got stronger to basically keep up with the plot and to maintain his championship belt, being the moving goalpost he was always meant to be. So in the Resurrection F movie only, I put Beerus at least 1.7 to 2 times Golden Freezer to heavily dominate and tank him if he tried. As we know, in the anime series and manga, Beerus is disgustingly more powerful. And in terms of Whis in the Resurrection F movie, guys, he's completely broken. Even with Toriyama's original scale, 6, 10, 15, I don't think he knew just what type of beast he created with Whis. Whis is how strong he needs to be for the plot. And that's always going to be top dog. Except for Grand Priest and Zeno, obviously. But if you want to know how much stronger Beerus got since the Battle of Gods movie, it's 61 times stronger. Beerus is 3.7 billion times that of Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku, and Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan Goku is 1.8 billion times that of Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku. Movie only. 
Talk about Goku's base form for a second in Battle of Gods. Now, this is the Battle of Gods anime series of Dragon Ball Super, and I think this also was mentioned in the Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods movie as well. Something similar in regards to Beerus assessing Goku's base form power and saying something along the lines of, how on earth did you defeat Frieza like this? Sort of a disbelief at the power he's feeling compared to Frieza's, and essentially confusing the fandom into thinking, wow, base Goku in, well, past the Buu saga now, couldn't defeat Frieza, so Goku's base form is not even 120 million. Did Beerus know about Frieza's final transformation? Funny thing is, if he's saying Goku in his base form couldn't defeat Frieza and he's referring to first form Frieza, that would mean Super Saiyan 50 times stacked on top of what he's feeling would be a highball of 26 million, and we know for a fact on Namek, Goku was 3 million at the start of the Goku vs. Frieza fight, and 150 million as a Super Saiyan. So obviously we know that part is out of the equation. Then it comes to the comparison of Frieza's maximum power back then in the Namek saga. Goku's base form couldn't defeat it right now, so it's not over 120 million. But what a lot of people don't realize is how base forms work. Some seem to think that base forms have a set power all of the time, and that is completely False. Let's go into it. Now, straight off the bat, you know right now, all of the power-ups from Namek all the way to the Buu Saga, you know straight away, Goku's base form has had so many power-ups, even plot power-ups, to the point his base form towers his Super Saiyan transformation on Namek. So does this mean it's a retcon, what Beerus said? So let's talk about that right now. Goku's base form is not always at 100% base power. Goku's base form can be as small as a power level of 5, all the way up to his maximum base power in the millions, or whatever. Goku's base form, Vegeta's base form, it's not a passive number non-stop. They keep their power suppressed for their normal day-to-day -day lives, and then in battle they can raise their base power. This is what a lot of people seem to forget, that they can raise their power without even transforming. This is what Goku did before Super Saiyan even came into the equation. Goku could raise his power, even without the Kaioken. Goku could raise his base power higher than what his level was currently at. We saw this against Nappa. Obviously, Goku's approach in power was much higher than a suppressed power, but he learned how to suppress his power as time went on. To the point where Future Trunks showed up against Frieza, they only sensed a power level of 5. This is Future Trunks, able to suppress his power down to that level, yet his power level could shoot up to the millions just for base form. So that's how base power works. Now when Beerus is assessing Goku's power on King Kai's planet, he's assessing Goku's non-combat base power. Goku's not even trying at the point Beerus is assessing his base power. He's not even in combat. Goku's not even fighting. He's got no reason to keep his base form at maximum power right there and then. He's relaxed. He's suppressed. Of course, his suppressed power, which could very well be a power level of five. Of course, Beerus is going to say, I don't think this power could defeat Frieza. First form, second form, third form, or final form. Of course not. Goku is super suppressed right now, but Goku could raise his base power much higher than final form Freezer on Namek. Go and watch the Dragon Ball Z anime, read the Dragon Ball manga. You will see there are so many power-ups that Goku got throughout the years. Characters you can gauge it against, much higher than Super Saiyan Goku on Namek and Final Form Freezer on Namek. There are still Dragon Ball fans out there that still don't know how base form power works, that you can raise it and lower it without even transforming. And it makes me think that did these guys only start watching Dragon Ball when Super Saiyan was introduced? To get the most out of Super Saiyan, your base power needs to be as high as it can be, then you stack the multiplier on top. This is why Goku in the Cell games, pre-Cell games, just living his day-to-day -day life in those 10 days, he was a Super Saiyan, yes. His base power was so suppressed while still stacking the 50 times multiplier on top. So his base form power could have very well been 5 or something like that. Stack 50 on top. Goku's suppressed Super Saiyan state in his day-to-day -day life could have been about 250 of a battle power just living his life. That's kind of how it works. That was the whole point. I want to talk about how fast Goku potentially is in the Dragon Ball Super manga, but I also want to talk about the end of the Goku Black arc, or Future Trunks arc, where the Omni King erased the world, Goku Vegeta Trunks getting the hell out of there, and I want to talk about what the Omni King actually did here, what we know from the manga itself, and I also want to talk about how Goku reappeared later on and managed to float in the white space and got hold of the Omni King and took him with him, and even talk and breathe. So first of all, Zeno uses his technique, his gigantic hack, makes everything disappear, wipes everything to the point where we see the time rings and the time ring actually disappears. It's destroyed. Now, as you all know, each of these time rings signifies a timeline. So that is actual confirmation that Zeno actually blitzed the timeline, not just 
the universe, not just all 12 universes or however universes are remaining in the future timeline. He severed the timeline where it's no longer connected. So it's literally gone back to square one or square zero, you could say. Because I know a lot of people thought he just erased the universes, but no, Zeno actually did a little bit more than that, severed the timeline as well. But that doesn't mean it's always gone because those time rings can be recreated. You can go to an infinite number of different points in the timeline and create a new time ring. Just because they don't exist at this time doesn't mean they can't exist if you do something to create that timeline again, if that makes sense. It's the whole point of the time rings appearing. But then comes a very interesting predicament when Goku decides to go and get the Omni King so he can give the present timeline Omni King a new buddy. And I asked you guys in my community tab about what the hell went on here because when Goku Trunks and the Time Machine arrive to where future Zeno is, there's tons of white space signifying he blitzed everything. It's just emptiness, all right? No universes. But what we have to accept is they are actually somewhere. Where are they? The only way to describe it is the emptiness in the future. The time machine can't go to emptiness. It doesn't work that way. It has to go to a specific point in time. Well, look what we have here. We have Trunks, Goku, and a time machine. A time machine that has just traveled to this specific point where even the Omni King goes, everything's gone. And even refers to Son Goku, literally showing us that this just happened. But how did they do that? Because the ring was destroyed, right? Well, the time machine actually has stored data in it. We all know this, it's been stated. Trunks has data in the time machine, which connects him to the present and where they are there in the future. Anyone can create a bridge to a different timeline. Trunks did it in Dragon Ball Z. There was no bridge until he created it. The moment Trunks and Goku went back to that future, it should have created a new time ring after they left with Zeno because that would have been a paradox. We never see that time ring created. We also never see the other time ring created when Trunks and Mai go to a different future. But I assume they happen because they would create paradoxes. Personally, I think if Zeno of all beings left that timeline, that's a pretty big paradox. Now, when it comes to Goku just float in there in the white space, what does this mean about his speed? If Zeno wiped out everything and there is nothing there, no dimensions, no living world, no hell, no heaven, nothing with time and space, he wiped out everything, right? If Goku moved in that white space, hell, even trunks, hell, even the metal off the time machine, does this make them have inaccessible speed or immeasurable speed? Because you have to think about it like this, a place with no time. When you do the equation, speed equals distance over time, you can't apply the equation. And that would be immeasurable speed because it's the ability to move so fast that the formula, speed equals distance over time, can't be applied. And Goku is freely moving in it, right? Some believe, and this is a valid point, that they just didn't give a shit about the logic and just wanted this scene to happen. Like, how is Goku able to breathe and talk in this void? Does the time machine have the same speed feet? That it's potentially an outlier? Now, what goes through my mind is this is a timeline now because they've re-established it. They've gone back there. So does that mean there is time? Because it is a point in time, if that makes sense. They could just be in the emptiness in between the universes that was already there. So how strong would Ultimate Goku have been at the point in Dragon Ball Super before the Tournament of Power? You remember when the old Kai says, I'll be willing to draw out your latent abilities beyond their boundaries. At that point, just how strong could Goku have really been? Obviously, they couldn't do it in story because there wasn't enough time left. But if you think about it, all they had to do was just go sit in the hyperbolic time chamber and get it done. I mean, Whis has already unearthed a load of potential in the guy, right? I mean, that's not even including any stacks because would stacks even work with the ultimate form? Think about it. God form are created through the use of God Key, whereas the ultimate form, the ultimate power, pretty much changes your limitations, increases your hard drive capacity, so to speak, also giving you raw power boost go along with that. And obviously, Gohan doesn't have God Key. But the truth is, if you've got Ultimate Goku plus God Key, would that stack even work? Because essentially, your ultimate power is your raw power, but then if you're enhancing your key to use it like a god, surely that should enhance it even more. Because utilizing god key is a style, is a technique of using your key in a more advanced way. So just think about that for a moment, it's friggin' insane. Look how much the god key amp gave Goku in Battle of Gods from his raw power at that time. We're talking millions, billions, trillions, whatever way you want to calculate it. Does he even have much potential left to be unlocked? Which if you think about it, Goku's always growing. There's never been a point where he's permanently at one level of power. 
The next arc, he's always above it. Just how far could his potential be drawn out? Maybe that would just bust Dragon Ball entirely. He would get to a level, or well, the intended level where he's obviously headed. Goku's gonna keep getting stronger and stronger. So would the ultimate form essentially bring future Goku forward? Get Dragon Ball over and done with, right? Too much power. What do you guys think? How strong could ultimate Goku really be? I mean, would this be the most broken character in history? Combine that with Ultra Instinct, it's almost like you've got maximum mind, body, and spirit. Some seem to think that latent ability should include Ultra Instinct, the technique, and or power. Some seem to think Goku wouldn't change. Some seem to think his raw power would be stronger than MUI, the silver-haired Ultra Instinct in the anime. Some seem to think easily stronger than Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20, he wouldn't have to transform at all to have such kind of power. Depends on how much potential he had left. And I mentioned before that it depends on what arc they're in and what limitations the arc sets for them. Cell Saga, Goku is tapped out, but in the next arc, he's a new beast. But that doesn't invalidate his previous arc's limits. As strong as the plot would need him to be, like with any form. As Whis describes Goku's Ultra Instinct as him tapping into his potential, I would think he would get the same power-up from a potential unleashed power-up. But obviously without the UI instinctual movement, just in terms of raw power. Remember, Ultimate is supposed to be everything. All the potential the user has at that time, but also increases their hard drive capacity so they can grow even stronger later on. Could have been a good move, but Goku would have been super busted. Enter Ultra Instinct Goku for the first time, and a smidge of Jira's power is now matched. But Goku doesn't seem to lose or gain any more ground after it's matched. It stated that Goku overcame the overwhelming difference in power, but didn't state it surpassed Jiren, just closed the gap. And this is when Ultra Instinct runs out, Jiren blasts Goku away and Goku is left drained. And Goku starts recovering from his base form for a while. Goku's recovery is so friggin' broken, whether it's his Saiyan perks or just general fitness, because Cauliflower squares up to Goku in his Super Saiyan 2 form, and as they fight, Goku is forced to transform to a Super Saiyan 2 himself, and this time Goku takes his Super Saiyan 2 form serious. Now at this point, when Goku said he's serious, I feel his body had recovered enough by that point to sustain Super Saiyan 2 for combat purposes, so there's no real reason to call Goku Super Saiyan 2 at this point a weakened Super Saiyan 2. It still looked pretty damn good. Now let's look at this from a scaling standpoint. Super Saiyan 2 originally toyed with Super Saiyan 2 Cauliflower, but now Super Saiyan 2 Cauliflower is pushing hard at Super Saiyan 2 Goku, so she is powered up massively as well. But this is the big one. Controlled Berserker Kale jumps in too, and there are times Goku is able to handle both of the levels of power at the same time in Super Saiyan 2. The only way they make him struggle is through the numbers game. And for the record, Controlled Kale is stated to be stronger than her Berserker state. Now going back, Super Saiyan Blue originally couldn't handle that at first. But now as a Super Saiyan 2, Goku is able to push back at the stronger Kale and Cauliflower at the same time. Which means Goku, during the recovery phase, has actually managed to progress his Super Saiyan 2 power beyond his start in Super Saiyan Blue power by a fair bit, because he's able to make an impact on Kale's body, something he couldn't do before. And this is the first massive jump of power we see Goku demonstrate when recovering. But it's apparent that when Goku hits Super Saiyan God, this puts him far above the original Super Saiyan Blue form at the beginning of the tournament, and he clearly woman handles the powered up Kale and powered up Cauliflower together, with ease, I might add. But all forms he go to typically can obviously be sustained because he powers up to them and fights in them accordingly. Goku's Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20 is enough to numb the arm of Super Saiyan 1 Kefla, who is stated by Whis to rival the power of the Spirit Bomb from earlier. And this goes to show us that Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20 has gone far beyond his previous Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20 limits. Goku finally smashes Kefla out of the ring with Ultra Instinct yet again. And from there, Goku is back to zero, being completely worn out and needs to recover. So guess what time it is? It's Goku recovery time for the second time. And it's in these recovery times that Goku's fitness and Saiyan perks really showcase their self and demonstrate Goku's mastery of his mind, body and spirit, allowing him to get stronger within battles. It's like a marathon runner who can actually recover as they run at a certain level due to their conditioning. Goku is like this. He's so friggin' fit. He's a freak. But from here, Goku remains in base for a long time and then later says to Gohan he's recovered stamina somewhat which looks like it only took about 10 minutes. So 10 magic minutes from drained and Goku's in an efficient stamina zone. That's crazy. Goku starts being considerate with his stamina and finally, it's round three against Jiren. Goku's Super Saiyan Blue form powers up right in front of Jiren, which based on Goku's stamina recovering ability is safe enough to use now. And this is just Super Saiyan Blue, no Kaioken. Goku swaps punches with Jiren and smiles. Has a conversation too. They also have a three-course meal during this scene. 
Something he failed to do as a Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20 earlier, and this appears to be the same Jiren as earlier using only a smidge of his power. We can safely say Goku was powered up dramatically somewhat after being pushed to his limits, then recovering. All in all, potentially nearly 30 minutes. Now Goku uses some techniques to combat Jiren, but Jiren showcases a stronger red presence now, seemingly up in the game and treats Super Saiyan Blue Goku like crap. But he soon backs off the newly powered up Jiren until Goku utilizes the Kaioken times 20 along with Vegeta's new blue form, proving to be able to push Jiren somewhat. Now this is what I want you to note down guys, Android 17 joins Vegeta and Goku's fight. Jiren is always dominant, but please note Android 17's seemingly same performance as Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 20 as it's able to take hits from Jiren too. And also please note Android 17 getting seriously damaged and hurt after sacrificing himself. But after they triple team Jiren, Goku is completely wasted yet again, and this appears to be the third time Goku undergoes the recovery phase, with potentially 5 minutes left. But Vegeta manages to give Goku some of his power to fight on. Goku gets up and is able to hit Super Saiyan Blue, showcasing that this third recovery session, with the help of Vegeta speeding it up, demonstrates that Goku is able to sustain Super Saiyan Blue, and he's ready to go again. Blue doesn't do much here, but then we get the next Ultra Instinct sequence. Now I won't cover the Ultra Instinct fight because all we need from it is that Goku's full Ultra Instinct pushes Jiren and himself to 100% maximum until Jiren is beaten the crap out of and burned out. And that's why I feel the Goku in Dragon Ball Super Broly movie is so much stronger than the beginning of the Tournament of Power. And by how much? Well, in 40 minutes, from start to finish, Goku gets 4 recovery periods. And this allows us to estimate, only estimate, that Goku is at least 20 times stronger after his second recovery period. After two recovery periods from being pretty much drained, with each period taking up about 10 minutes, we can make this easy and say that Goku has the potential and fitness to recover himself to a sufficient battle condition in around 10 minutes. That right there, the recovery of Goku, is the true amazing part about him. He's a Saiyan, and the Tournament of Power truly showed us how a fully fit, battle prime Goku can benefit from fighting and recovering in a short space of time. His Saiyan perks have become unreal. Goku is a fully automated battle machine. He's a rolling snowball that soon becomes an avalanche if you're not careful. Let's go through every level of Ultra Instinct with the information we currently have from the Dragon Ball Super anime and manga combined. The state of the gods possesses major differences at each level. If you're a fan of Ultra Instinct, give this video a thumbs up. It really helps me out and I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Angels are in a constant state of UI, and currently Goku has to transform to utilize his full potential of UI. This doesn't mean Goku's full UI power is the same as Angel's though. As it was clearly demonstrated with a fresh silver-haired Goku, he was no match against a calm Whis. Also, look at the difference in how Whis handled Moro, compared to how Goku handled Moro. We are only just beginning to see what Goku's UI is truly capable of, and I believe there's much more to come. Now, Goku was stated to be the weakest UI user in Dragon Ball, which is a huge shock considering what Goku's achieved power-wise overall. Let's be begin with the first level, and remember, these are comparing levels and not the fighters themselves. Pseudo Ultra Instinct So first of all, I'm giving a nod at Master Roshi's performance against Jiren. You can argue it's not branched off what Ultra Instinct is. Although this isn't the same as Ultra Instinct's sign that Goku used in a larger time limit, Master Roshi's version behaves in a similar manner to it, but isn't quite the level of Ultra Instinct's sign. Master Roshi became capable of utilizing a similar, but not quite as advanced, automatic dodging technique. He can instinctively anticipate the tactics and attack patterns of his foe, even while blindfolded, enabling him to seamlessly evade harm, causing Beerus to believe he was actually using Ultra Instinct itself. Such a feat made Whis declare that Master Roshi at the time was by far the closest mortal to understanding the Master in Ultra Instinct, even though he is unaware of it. Master Roshi can only use this pseudo form of Ultra Instinct when his heart is clear. Year. There is no appearance change, but he does appear with much more focus, but it's the first steps that Goku soon undergoes to obtain the next level in the Tournament of Power. The next level of Ultra Instinct is what we first saw in the Tournament of Power, known as Ultra Instinct Sign. We also saw Goku utilize this level against Moro during his encounter on Earth, albeit with more control. Goku is seemingly knowing what he has become to some extent. Different to Roshi, it's more noticeable even in appearance. It's almost like an Ultra Instinct tease, tapping into a little bit of the true potential. You could say how it resembled the old false Super Saiyan and actual Super Saiyan forms back in the day. There is a significant jump in power, but Goku originally utilized this with more defensive properties, but eventually he went went into a deeper state of UI and was finally able to utilize attack and defense. After his training with Maris, it holds a great balance in stamina. 
The next level is Ultra Instinct. I like to refer to this as just Ultra Instinct. Even back in the Tournament of Power, some referred to this as Mastered Ultra Instinct, but after Goku's body breaking in the fight with Jiren and taking some time to tap into this, we really can't say it's Mastered. The same way Goku fought Freezer on Namek, he didn't master Super Saiyan the first time he went into that form. He was getting used to it, yes, but it wasn't Mastered. This is the silver haired and eyed appearance where Goku is significantly in his peak condition. Albeit with stamina issues, classic Dragon Ball Super theme there, the state of the gods utilizing God Key in the most divine way possible for a mortal at this point, and Goku was able to fight Jiren with it. The level of UI always reminds me of Goku going Super Saiyan on Namek for the first time, whereas later down the line, Goku obtains much more control over it, and it leads us to the next level of Ultra Instinct. And just for the record, the silver haired Ultra Instinct is way more powerful than Ultra Instinct Sign. Perfected Ultra Instinct. Similar to Goku's mastery of Super Saiyan being able to transform at will, Goku was able to perfect the transformation into Ultra Instinct during his fight with Moro and demonstrated while taking on Whis in training. Although this level of power proved nothing against Whis, we cannot deny Goku is at his current strongest, showcasing and wielding Ultra Instinct in the transformed state much easier and with more stability than he did against Jiren. It also looks less straining on the body, perhaps to Goku's body strengthening through his training with Meris. But this level of control of UI reminds me of the time Goku came back from Yardrat where he was able to wield the Super Saiyan transformation with relative ease. Transform at will. Goku uses Ultra Instinct with a twist when fighting Granola. He combines the capabilities of Ultra Instinct with his Super Saiyan God and Blue forms in order to raise the game in those forms. This is not necessarily the next level of the previous one or greater than it, but it's a necessary learning curve in order to progress to a level further after this. Apparently, Ultra Instinct works better when used in conjunction with Super Saiyan forms. It's now a transformation buff an enhancing ability. Of course, we find out around this time that even when Goku utilizes the full Ultra Instinct against Granola, it still has weaknesses such as stamina issues and also a loss of efficiency the longer the fight goes on. Which means the next level after this should no longer have those problems. In Dragon Ball Super Manga Chapter 82, it has been teased through the conversation of Whis and Goku, that because Goku cannot handle Ultra Instinct like Whis does because they are totally different beings, they think and act differently, there is a hint at Goku's unique Ultra Instinct. And there are hints that it is linked to Goku's Saiyan heritage. Whatever that level of Ultra Instinct looks like, I'll make a detailed video down the line. But as of right now, we know there is a unique Ultra Instinct for Goku. How strong will it be? How will it match up to Whis's Ultra Instinct? My gut feeling tells me that it still won't. Who knows where they're going to go in the future of Dragon Ball Super. Mastered Ultra Instinct. Although this name has been thrown around like Gogeta's confetti, without any understanding of the word mastered, what I truly believe is the next step of Ultra Instinct for Goku is to truly master the silver-haired version of Ultra Instinct and maintain the power in his day-to-day -day life 24-7. Very similar to Mastered Super Saiyan in the Cell games after he and Gohan finished training in the Hyperbolic Time Chamber. This would make sense because Goku is able to willingly transform into UI right now. Wouldn't it make sense for him? The next step would be to eradicate that weird instability feeling while in that form and harness the state of UI daily as best as he can. That would logically be the next step of elevating to a new level of UI beyond that because if he can hold the silver hair in his day to day life, when he actually powers up against a strong enemy, his UI will be far stronger when powered up. And you could look at this as Super Saiyan Grade 4, how he was far better at fighting Cell than Vegeta and Trunks were just because he got used to the regular Super Saiyan form and adapted it into his day to day life. Now most of these are theorized, but some are legit in terms of their levels that Whis has mentioned and what's been stated. This is where Goku goes from here if he's able to control the silver here for long periods of time. The only way to go from here is the level of UI that Whis and the other angels are at. And I believe this was the level of Meris, wielding the power of UI in the state of his base form without even needing to transform, or only transform if he really needs to. Now, how does that make sense? Well, maybe this one, there are levels within levels. Perhaps the starting version of base Ultra Instinct is where Goku, for example, can tap into however much of the UI power he needs to whilst still in his base form, except for the highest amounts of UI power, where he needs to transform to access the rest of it. Whereas someone like Whis is able to utilize more percentage of the Ultra Instinct power in his base form without the need to transform. Now, Whis did state that the Grand Priest has a higher level of UI than himself, and we know angels are in a passive state of UI, so does this mean the Grand Priest is naturally stronger than Whis and the other angels, or he's just in a higher UI state? Which one makes the Grand Priest stronger? And this leads me to the next possible Ultra Instinct level that separates the likes of Goku and Whis.
It's called Base Form Ultra Instinct Level 2. If Goku accessed this power, it would be where he no longer needs to transform to access the full percentage of the UI power. He's harnessed the full power in his base form. This could be the end of Z Goku, who knows? The state of mind needed for UI can be switched on or off whenever he feels the need to, without the destruction of his own stamina, without the superficial look as well, the silver hair. And I feel this should be the end goal for Goku's training, where he can still be happy, excited, sad, angry, but in the blink of an eye, can fall into the UI state in his base form just like that to become his strongest, losing all attachment, no emotion in the middle of a fight. This is the level I feel Whis has and demonstrates this emptiness perfectly in his base form, especially in combat, and although Whis is stronger than Goku in strength alone, this level 2 UI base form, as well as his strength, gives him the edge even more during any battle situation over Goku. However, I feel that even though there is a constant state of UI, without the need to transform, there is still room for improvement even for Whis, but it's the fine tuning. In order to get to the Grand Priest levels, where do we go from here? How could you possibly tune a passive state of Ultra Instinct? What could we say is the level of UI that Grand Priest has? Is it potentially the strongest? Let's call this Base Form Ultra Instinct Level 3. This is the foreseen ultimate level of Ultra Instinct which the Grand Priest has. It's not just like the Angels have like Whis where they are in a passive state or can use how little or how much they want of the UI power while in the base form. This level 3 version of UI that the Grand Priest has is a constant 100% power, no side effects in terms of stamina, no weaknesses in battle situation. In this state of 100% full power base form UI, the Grand Priest can be the perfect killing machine taking on hundreds of hundreds of Angels like Whis all at the same time. That is my guesstimation. A level like this could only be beaten or matched by someone who has also harnessed the 100% power of UI passively without falling out of that state ever, doing it for millions or billions of years. Whereas Goku in base could slip in and out of UI because the guy's got a soul and Whis is in a constant state of UI but the Grand Priest is in this deep state of no emotion, basically soulless, to the point where he's fine-tuned his UI and explored every single avenue of combat within it. Yes, it's similar to Whis's UI level but so much more experience and mastery of the passive state. And due to the Grand Priest being the father, only he has acquired this level due to his time existing and maybe in another million years, someone like Whis could possibly achieve it. Which brings me to the next level of Ultra Instinct, which I believe is plausible, and that is called Final Ultra Instinct. What's beyond level 3? Well, it can only be obtained by angelic beings. It's the full-powered Ultra Instinct transformation that only angels can use. This is the ultimate angel transformation if angels meet a challenge they cannot defeat. They go balls deep and unlock everything. Their true power. And maybe Grand Priest is the only one who can do this, who knows? But I would expect an appearance change as well. And I say this form because we said to Goku he could learn to make UI his base form and only transform if needed. What does that mean? Well, if you think about angels as well, they are in a passive state, so could they transform if needed as well? Perhaps a silver-haired, silver-eyed version of the angels, a brand new angelic form for angels where they tap into the final power of Ultra Instinct, which actually saps their stamina and essence. That would be pretty cool. Maybe this is only obtainable if the user relinquishes every emotion they have. Like in a previous video I mentioned about Goku selling his soul to obtain Final Ultra Instinct, a state where after mastering it in the base form, you can go one step further beyond that and transform if needed. This is possible, but I don't know yet. Why would there be a need to transform if you already have 100% constantly in base without any drawback? Like, it's a pointless transformation, right? But Dragon Ball loves toys, so I can see anything happening, maybe for angels only though. The rivalry between Dragon Ball GT and Dragon Ball Super has gone on for many years, but now it has finally been settled after Dragon Ball released official material in Super Dragon Ball Heroes, where Xeno Goku faces Capsule Corporation Goku Ultra Instinct vs Super Saiyan 4. Now this rivalry has been mostly fan vs fan than series vs series, and it never seemed to end. Until now, we actually have the only official material of the best of God versus the best of Monkey. In this video, I'll break down the battle between Ultra Instinct and Super Saiyan 4, let you know about the power comparison and give my final thoughts on this conclusion because I don't think I ever expected to see two of my favorite forms actually square off at their maximum power. There have been a lot of inconsistencies and wild trips in power in the Super Dragon Ball Heroes anime since it began. One noticeable one was at the start, where Super Saiyan 4 squared off against Super Saiyan Blue Goku in an equal battle despite what the video game portrayed. But within a few episodes, it was established that Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta 
did better against Super Saiyan 3 Kumba than Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken Vegito did against Base Kumba. And from there, Super Dragon Ball heroes would promote any form and make it look good in battle where typically Super Saiyan Blue and Super Saiyan 4 were relative in power as the show progressed. There always seemed to be a rivalry between Xeno Goku and Capsule Corporation Goku. However, when it came to Dragon Ball Super's new flagship form, Ultra Instinct along with the godly upgrade to Super Saiyan 4 known as Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4, these forms were the heavy artillery of both Gokus and always did exceptionally well in their episodes, but we never got a straight up comparison in power in battle until now. It was always speculation and flip flop in power creeps throughout the story. In Super Dragon Ball Heroes Ultra God Mission Episode 10, the main plot of the story is concluded in the first half, but then the Super Space Time Tournament begins with a bunch of Dragon Ball Dream matches taking place. One of most importance, Xeno Goku vs Capsule Corp Goku, the Goku from GT's timeline, and the Goku from Super's timeline. And for the record, yes, Capsule Corp Goku is Dragon Ball Super's Goku due to his transformation tree, just like Xeno Goku is GT's Goku due to him referencing his Shadow Dragon's battle when he achieved his Limit Breaker form. I like to think of Xeno Goku as the Goku that never left with Shenlong because Omega Shenron was defeated before Goku ascended to his godly level in GT. What's also awesome is that Xeno Goku has been heavily implied to be movie Goku as well which supports everything in Dragon Ball GT being linked to the movie-verse. But this battle between the two Gokus stems from the beginning of Super Dragon Ball Heroes itself. The battle begins with Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4 Goku vs Ultra Instinct Omen being equal in combat where Omen has the edge in speed while Super Saiyan 4 has the edge in raw strength. As demonstrated when Omen gracefully jumped over a point blank warp Kamehameha but was soon acquainted with a monstrous hurting bomb punch to the face after he failed to block the oncoming force of Xeno Goku. The two complement each other and continue to have a huge battle and a beam struggle with both are left exhausted standing there. It's at this point Dragon Ball GT fans will be super pleased, pun intended, that an official anime, no matter how absurd the story gets, actually put the best of monkey power equal to Ultra Instinct Omen, which by concept is an absolute win and something a lot of us never thought we would actually see. We're conceptually using Super Dragon Ball Heroes, Super Saiyan 4 is greater than Super Saiyan God and is much closer to Blue, but the Blue Kaioken and Ultra Full Power Saiyan 4 would be relative, I guess. But the jump from those to Ultra Instinct Sign and Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4 is pretty much the same. Needless to say, this is something I feel we'll never get again in anime form, which is why Super Dragon Ball Heroes deserves some respect for giving us dream matches and nostalgic moments that we've always thought about, even if they aren't delivered with any depth. But it's at this point in the fight where Xeno Goku states he's going to use the last bit of his power, but Capsule Corp Goku has a final bit of power left, which he uses to power up to Mastered Ultra Instinct, or just Ultra Instinct, the silver version, to which Xeno Goku misses his punch and Ultra Instinct to full power connects and Xeno Goku falls to the ground admitting he lost. This is immediately followed by Super Goku also falling down, both exhausted but clearly showing the full Ultra Instinct was greater than Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4. No matter if it was by one punch, no matter if both were drained after battle, a win is a win. Ultra Instinct bested Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4, who gave everything, but it also took Super Goku the greatest form in Dragon Ball Super to beat Monkey, and I think this is a great outcome for everyone. Even when the fight was announced, I never saw Xeno Goku beating Capsule Corp Goku because Xeno Goku isn't the main timeline Goku anymore. He's a Goku from a different timeline, a different continuity, that joined Super Dragon Ball Heroes after Capsule Corp Goku was introduced. Capsule Corp Goku is essentially the main protagonist of this show. And with the flagship form Ultra Instinct, there is no way in hell they would ever write the main hero with his pinnacle power to lose against Xeno Goku in a final battle. From both a story and marketing standpoint, remember Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4, despite its upgrade, is still Super Saiyan 4. It's all in the name. It's still a near 30 year old transformation concept. So the new Ultra Instinct could not lose to a 30 year old transformation in a fair one versus one battle. In a promotional anime, promote in Dragon Ball and its new godly concepts, it just wouldn't make any sense. It would be like Super Saiyan 4 losing to Super Saiyan 1 in Dragon Ball GT. But in the same respect of Super Saiyan 4 in the original continuity, you can tell how much love the staff the writers have for Monkey. Not take Super Saiyan God, not Blue, not Omen, but the complete Ultra Instinct to finally beat it. The top form of modern Goku to take down the veteran 30 year old classic Super Saiyan 4. And the great thing about it is it's all okay, it was a great fight and both were awesome. Even as a GT fan who loves Super Saiyan 4, I respect the winner in this and, and past the days of Band about GT versus Super. I would have gone crazy some years ago over this fight, but it was time to grow up, be a bit more professional, and look at the whole franchise for what it is. So they still do have a lot of love for Super Saiyan 4 for it to go all the way to Ultra Instinct. They have a lot of love for Ultra Instinct by not letting it get beat, and it still remains their most badass transformation in Super. 
but still it was a cherry on top to see both Goku exhausted and I'm satisfied with this. Limit Breaker Super Saiyan 4 equals Ultra Instinct Omen, but for fun there is a concept above Super Saiyan 4 in GT that could rival the full Ultra Instinct or even surpass it. Sure you could take Goku's change state against Yi Xinglong that was leagues above Super Saiyan 4, end of GT Goku before even merging with Shenlong was hacks. So I guess it's how you interpret his unknown power that seemed invincible and could tank minus energy balls. All that versus the Ultra Instinct concept, and personally I would go with Change State Goku above any Super Saiyan 4 variation, even Limit Breaker, and that would be GT's complete package Goku, just like Ultra Instinct is Super's complete package Goku. I don't think anyone in Dragon Ball is getting near end of GT Goku, especially when he merged with Shenlong. He became the god of Dragon Ball. But let's be honest, many who watch GT still don't fully understand what happened to Goku's power during his fight with Yi Xinglong, and those who never watched GT properly or at all wouldn't even be aware of Goku's ascended power during the Genki Dama unless they researched and read the interviews and read the dialogue, which would be around 70% or more of the modern Dragon Ball fanbase not knowing what Goku's final power is in Dragon Ball GT. So from a marketing perspective, a promotional anime standpoint, we wouldn't get Goku's change state versus Ultra Instinct because Super Saiyan 4 is where the hype is at, where the money is at, where the love has always been, but I think this is a cool comparison comparison of powers. It's a cool time to be a fan of all series in Dragon Ball because Dragon Ball is one giant multiverse of continuities and if you still want to debate GT vs Super using scientific calculations or raw power scaling that's cool too but there'll only ever be speculations compared to what we have here in an official Dragon Ball anime. No matter if you like or dislike Super Dragon Ball Heroes whether you take it serious or not this is what we've got and all we'll get in terms of crossovers I believe. And that's it Super Saiyan 4 vs Ultra Instinct is over. I always knew when when a time like this came along, even Super Dragon Ball Heroes would be taken more seriously in terms of discussion, despite it being a wacky non-serious roller coaster over the last few years. In my opinion, it's fan service done right, but Ultra Instinct has to be put over the Super Saiyan 4 transformation because it is the most recent flagship form in Dragon Ball. So no matter which series you prefer, Dragon Ball GT or Dragon Ball Super, both concepts are done a service, and it's a win for both in different ways. It's up to us which we like more, but here's the kicker guys. It's absolutely okay to like both, and I think this fandom should learn from that because it shouldn't be about sides fighting each other, but rather accepting that both sides will always have love and support. We can all put the swords down because Dragon Ball clearly never had swords up against their series at all, but at least they've ended it. Respect to Ultra Instinct for winning, respect to Super Saiyan 4 for lasting 30 years, maybe we'll get another sequel one day, but I think this is it, and I'm perfectly okay with it. Will Goku ever defeat Beerus in Dragon Ball Super? Some of you may think he will, some of you may think he won't. I'm on the side inclined to believe that he will never defeat Beerus. But before we get into this video, please hit the like. I want to hear all of your comments below on if you think Goku will ever defeat Beerus and do you think it's a good idea. To start this video off, I'm going to talk about Beerus and his introduction to the world of Dragon Ball. Starting with Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods, Beerus took the Dragon Ball universe, the fandom, by storm. He's a character, a benchmark, in which arguably, especially in the manga, has not been surpassed by Goku, and in all continuities, the movie, the anime series, the manga, we haven't even seen Beerus' true potential. It's been 10 years since we've been introduced to this guy, and he's still a mystery. Now bear in mind when making this video, I've considered that there are ways in which Goku can be scaled higher than Beerus in the anime version of Dragon Ball Super. But when watching this video, consider Dragon Ball Super as a whole story, from a write-in standpoint, which it always should be, as that's the intention of the ones who's making it. Nobody knows what's going to happen with Beerus. And to be honest, he's the most popular character in Dragon Ball Super. And I mean that in terms of the newly introduced characters. I know, of course, he came in in Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods, but you know what I'm saying, he's in the Dragon super part of the story of the franchise. Now upon Beerus's arrival and how Goku became a Super Saiyan God, how the fight went down, how Goku didn't win, but there was a bigger message behind all of that in terms of there's still a long way to go for Goku in terms of his training journey. Beerus even mentions there's stronger people out there still, other gods of destruction, fighters in other universes, we know the score with that. In terms of Beerus's potential, we know he's a moving goalpost, his power is whatever the plot needs it to be, because power creeps get insane in Dragon Ball. If 
characters like Goat get to a certain level of power, where they can comfortably be scaled to be higher than Beerus's last known level of power, the writers then have to step in and change things up to make sure Beerus is still at the top of the food chain. Ultimately, what I'm getting at is by the end of the fight in Battle of Gods, it's sort of left everyone guessing, will there be a rematch between Beerus and Goku where one day Goku would defeat Beerus, surpass the level that Beerus is at by undergoing the training throughout Dragon Ball Super, that being mastering god powers, in Goku's case attaining Ultra Instinct, something that Beerus has never been able to master. It's felt for a while that they are pushing Goku to get to that level where he will eventually surpass Beerus in the story, crystal clear, and that would be the end of the story. The story of Son Goku in Dragon Ball Super, the progression in the world of the gods. That's what Goku's journey in Dragon Ball Super means to me. And that's what Beerus' character feels like it is in Dragon Ball Super. It's a benchmark for Goku to beat. But let's talk about what losing to Beerus would mean. As we are all aware, in the manga version of events, we've passed the Moro arc, we've passed the Granola arc, we're in Super Hero. We've got the Black Freezer arc to tie up. Goku is still getting stronger as he goes along. He's learning new aspects to Ultra Instinct. Who knows how far he's actually going to go. But let's look to a possible future where, after a few more arcs, Goku decides to take on Beerus all out where the writing is not letting them destroy the universe this time. Maybe they go to the world of Void, who knows. Either way, something pans out and they fight each other. And at the end of the fight, Goku still loses to Beerus. What would that mean for Goku's story in Dragon Ball Super? Well, I don't think it would hurt it at all. In fact, I think it makes it very interesting because it means that Goku is not able to beat everybody. Goku is not able to surpass everyone. Goku had a limit and this was it. Beerus, the god of destruction, is a level he cannot get to. Simple as that. And I think that's absolutely fine. Even for a character like Goku, who is all about go, 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 stronger, 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 break limits. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with him reaching new levels. But I'm also fine with him actually having a limit to himself, where I think it would be a healthy dose of power creep vaccine to show everybody once and for all, this is Son Goku, and this is the maximum power he will be. There's nothing else after it. And from there, you can go with other stories in terms of other characters, or even Goku trying to maintain his prime through the years. And as he's getting older, he's losing that prime. And that could make a very tense story as well. But I don't think they're going to go that route. But then there's the other side of the coin where Goku does beat Beerus. He attains his best version of Ultra Instinct. I do not know what that would be called. In this possible outcome, I assume he would have mastered it. He takes on Beerus. He wins. He's completed his training journey. It's very poetic, seeing as he lost in Battle of Gods against Beerus. But now he takes on Beerus' best and he beats it at the end. That's the complete story story of Dragon Ball Super. That would tie Goku's journey up nice and neat, and it's definitely a possible outcome, but if they went that way, it would create a bunch of problems within the story of Dragon Ball and amongst the characters themselves, especially Beerus. Let's talk about Beerus's goals, his motivation, his nature, his strength. What does he want in the Dragon Ball Super story? What is he searching for? Upon his arrival, he wanted to fight the Super Saiyan God. Straight away, we understand that his personality, his character, is similar to Goku in that he seeks to fight strong opponents, and he's excited in doing that. That's what resonated with Beerus when fighting Goku. He had a similar nature when it came to combat. So from that moment, I never assumed he was someone who would be waiting for a character to hit his level to finally beat him. He's just waiting around doing nothing. That doesn't seem like a character who enjoys the thrill of battle, and also a competitive character. In the manga, when he's fighting the other gods of destruction in the Zen exhibition, Beerus stands his ground and he has a lot of pride in himself as a warrior. He does not want to lose to anybody. If he was looking for somebody to kick his butt, then why doesn't he go to one of these strong characters in Dragon Ball Super and let them do that? No, he doesn't want to do that. He wants to fight the best, but he also wants to win. It's just that so far, in terms of Goku and Vegeta, they don't make him work hard at all. But if he wasn't the strongest god of destruction, think about this, if he wasn't the strongest, he could go to the strongest god of destruction, whoever you think that is. If you think any other character in Dragon Ball Super is stronger than Beerus, he could have gone to any of these characters and got his ass kicked. Finally, someone stronger than me. No, that didn't happen. And that also makes me believe he is still stronger than anyone who has shown up in Dragon Ball Super, except the angels, the hierarchy. But Gods of Destruction, yes, I believe Beerus is the best all-round fighter who can win any one-on-one battle with all Gods of Destructions. Maybe not physically the strongest, but it doesn't take 
brute power to just win a fight. We knew that all the way from Dragon Ball Z. So in terms of Beerus' nature, he's not waiting around for Goku to beat him. He's waiting around for Goku to get to a level where he can have an exciting battle. But he wouldn't just lay down, he will try and beat Goku. And in terms of Goku's development, Beerus assessing his power as he's going along. Beerus has seen the Ultra Instinct power. He's witnessing Goku get stronger as he goes along. Goku is stronger than him. He would not allow him to stay there for long. Beerus would train. We've seen him meditate in certain panels in the manga. There's a chance Beerus could do off-screen training to keep on top. That could be why he's a moving goalpost. However strong these characters in Super are becoming, like Goku, etc., Beerus sees this and goes, uh, uh I don't think so. He widens the gap. That could be a possibility in why he is this moving goalpost of power. Some people seem to think he's a static power. The same in Battle of Gods as he's always been. He just sleeps and does nothing. I believe Beerus gets stronger off screen through the plot, obviously, but through his meditation. And also there is a panel where he says, my mind is always on destruction. He's always getting stronger. He could be passively growing. Beerus has straight up said there's no limit to his power. How it genuinely might work is that there is no limit to power with Ultra Ego and Ultra Instinct as they are ever evolving. So the only way to beat somebody who uses it is to learn it yourself and do it better than them or learn a superior technique. Goku can tap into UI at will now, but he's still only the beginner level, whereas Beerus is a high level destruction energy user. The polar opposite to Ultra Instinct and Weezer's teachings. That's how it's being portrayed now in the manga in terms of ancient angelic versus god techniques. Goku goes one path, Vegeta goes the other. And that's why Moro nearly blew up because he basically skipped from 1 to 100. It takes a long time to master these techniques. Or heck, just mastering the level you're at. Because there's always more to it, especially Ultra Instinct, right? We know that. Look, if Goku will beat Beerus, it could be after the end of Z, if they create a new continuity after those events, but I don't think he will beat Beerus anytime soon. Remember, Beerus has expressed how bored he was until Goku came along. But if it's the case where destroyers are not normally allowed to fight each other due to it just destroying the universes in a counterproductive way, then if Goku is to be any sort of a match against Beerus, then that would still put the universe in danger with the powers squaring off, unless Goku fights in a non-destructive way similar to Battle of Gods, where he counters Beerus and saves the universe. But then and how do you determine the best fighter if the fight is no longer focusing on the two of them, but rather focusing on the destruction of the surroundings? These two at maximum power will probably never happen due to the fact it will be so dangerous. It will be the dangers of Battle of Gods multiplied by quadrillions, quintillions, however big you want the number to be in your power scaling. But there's always the power of writing to just discard that threat, seeing as it was only focused drama in Battle of Gods and never again. So that adds to my reason why I don't think Goku will beat this guy. I think Beerus is a ceiling Goku will never reach. Because Beerus is immortal. Goku is a mortal. And although Goku has utilized Ultra Instinct and he's slowly beginning to master it in his own way, Goku's only been alive for 40 years. Beerus has been alive millions of years. He's got a lot of background there in terms of battle. The fact that we haven't even seen his maximum power yet should just explain it all. It would make sense they are saving it in the writing for a very specific portrayal of dominance. Now let's talk about Ultra Instinct. This is another reason why I cannot see Goku defeating Beerus. Can you imagine? After all this time, the last 10 years, Beerus gets introduced, Goku undergoes his journey, obtains Ultra Instinct, gets to the highest level of Ultra Instinct he possibly can, then he defeats Beerus with something that Beerus never could master or even utilize properly in the millions of years of his life. How pathetic would that make Beerus look? Think about it. Millions of years of his life, he couldn't utilize it properly. Goku does it in less than a decade. Beerus would be a laughing stock in the story, he would be a laughing stock for allowing someone like Goku to get to that level and defeat him without doing anything about it. Sure, it could play into the fact that Beerus is arrogant, overconfident in his own power, then suddenly Ultra Instinct just eclipses Beerus, but it would make Beerus' character look like a total dummy for losing to something that these gods of destruction have been seeking for to put into their combat arsenal for millions of years and none of them could do it, but Goku could in less than a decade. There has to be something there where Beerus is just so much stronger in terms of raw power that not even Ultra Instinct can dent him. That would be a big eye-opener for Goku, and that would protect the character of Beerus as well. Would it be a waste if Goku goes through all of this 
only to fight Beerus and Beerus still wins, would that be a waste? Sure, you can argue that. This is why there has to be more in Dragon Ball Super than just that goal. I primarily think that Goku's journey to fight Beerus again one day, that that is the primary goal. Just that visualization of Goku finally doing it. But this is where Dragon Ball Super needs to be focusing on other characters and their goals, their ambitions completing their stories, Vegeta's. Some argue Vegeta will be the one to defeat Beerus. We already know Goku's not interested in becoming the next God of Destruction, so Beerus definitely can't be waiting around for him to beat him. But Vegeta, I also think he's not interested in the God of Destruction role either. But we know Goku is Whis's apprentice. Vegeta is technically Beerus's now. Would it be poetic if Vegeta beats his master? Yes. But would that then mean Goku has to defeat Whis? I cannot see that happening. I don't think it's a good idea that Goku gets ahead of these angels. It's nice to have a benchmark that nobody can meet. Beerus and the angels are that. If you ask me, I think something else is going to happen in the story in terms of Beerus being defeated. Could be by the hands of Black Frieza, where Ultra Instinct Goku, Ultra Ego Vegeta, Legendary Super Saiyan Broly, Orange Piccolo, Beast Gohan, all of them will have to team up to take down Black Frieza because they're all being pushed in their individual power trees, like Power Rangers. Right now, it seems like they're all being portrayed in a similar bracket. Pick your poison, sells the toys too. But no, I don't see Goku or Vegeta defeating Beerus. I think it would ultimately make Beerus' character a total mockery. Because you would have to look at his entire character throughout Dragon Ball Super and realize what has he actually done? He saw these guys getting stronger. He saw these guys get to a level that may rival him. He fights them and gets obliterated. Heck, it could even be a close battle. But why risk it if you are a competitive character? If you have the will to win, as he's shown against the other Gods of Destructions. It could be he doesn't want to be looked at as a laughing stock in front of the Gods of Destructions, so he does his best. But wouldn't he be the biggest laughing stock if he lost to these mortals? How would the Gods of Destructions look at Beerus if he's the guy who lost to these others? Allowing it to happen. Wouldn't be good on his reputation. Maybe that's the day he finally stands down. Personally, I don't think he's going to be defeated. And my number one reason why I don't think this is going to happen is Oob. Let me tell you about Oob. When Oob helped in the Moro arc, his power was a big deal. He effortlessly gave energy, unknowingly, and that small amount of power of Oob supercharged Ultra Instinct. That portion of power was able to generate an amped up Ultra Instinct level of power. Think of that right now. This is the reincarnation of Kid Buu. Yes, Kid Buu. Super Saiyan 3 level Kid Buu. If Oob is teased in the Moro arc to have this level of power, and it's also been teased that Goku will one day meet with Oob, which goes in line with End of Z, because as we know, Toyotaro has officially stated End of Z is still happening. Dragon Ball Super is tying into the original Dragon Ball Z ending. Hate me for saying that, but that's what they said. I'm just the messenger. Think about this. If Goku is so excited to find this Oob and fight against him, that would mean Oob is stronger than Beerus. Think about it. If Goku's goal throughout Dragon Ball Super was to fight Beerus and defeat him, and he succeeds in doing that, why would Goku be excited to fight someone at the level of Oob? He should be far stronger than Oob. It's like Goku in the Cell games excited to fight Zarbon or something. How would that make any sense? So the reason why I don't think Goku is going to defeat Beerus is because he's going to be way too high of a goal to meet, but Oob is someone not quite at Beerus' level, but he's at a level which will give Goku the fight of his life because fighting Beerus was still overkill. They need to protect the character of Oob going into the end of Dragon Ball Super, into the end of Z. This is the guy Goku is excited to fight. If you've already fought the best in Beerus, you're not going to settle for anything less. It would kill the entire story and build-up of Oob, unless, of course, they make Oob stronger than Beerus. That's why I don't think Goku is going to defeat Beerus, because of Oob and where his power is placed, where it should be placed. We are very close to the end of Z now. In Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, Goku's base form there should be pretty close to where Oob's is in the end of Z. That's going with it tying in, as it's been officially stated to be. But that's my thoughts on why Goku will never defeat Beerus in Dragon Ball Super. Yes, it would be poetic. Yes, it would tie up nice and neatly Goku's progression in the realm of the gods. He started against Beerus, he lost. He ended the series and he beat him. But then you have to weigh up everything else going on around that. Would that be the sensible thing to do? You guys let me know in the comments what you think would be the best outcome for Dragon Ball Super. Should Goku defeat Beerus at the end of Dragon Ball Super? Or should he still lose to him? Or not even fight him at all? Just never surpass him? How do you think that works when considering the story of Oob? Is there an off chance they will do something entirely different with Oob and make him stronger than he should be? Because if you can supercharge an Ultra Instinct level fighter, it really questions how strong these characters are in the end of Z. What Beerus does after all this... That's an entirely different video. And maybe I'll talk about that one again. 
what Beerus is going to do at the end of Dragon Ball Super, or what happens to him. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hit the like on your way out. Subscribe for more Dragon Ball content. I'll see you all in the next one. Keep being a role model.